This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Roger sits down with Richard Goldberg, who serves as a senior advisor for the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, or FDD. They discuss Saudi Arabia-Israel relations, ongoing challenges posed by Iran aggression in the Middle East, and the future of the Abraham Accords. Rich Goldberg, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I, I, I should have dressed up, but you know what? I'm I'm like a Western governor out on the <laughs> ranch. You know, that's how I feel. Summer is still here. I'm going to put my full Reagan in. I don't have my hat. I got my boots on, but you know, it's... It, it, well, we'll okay. just imagine you wearing those boots and give you there a pass you for, for you the go. for the informality. I like that. Uh, although you're Midwest, as I as I uh, know from uh, uh, before, so on your way right. out there. I'm I'm from the the land of Reagan. We'd say the land of Lincoln, but it's the land of Reagan. That's right. Well, we like pairing them together. That works for us. Uh, well, for our uh, listeners and viewers, Rich, uh, you're known for your current position in. in with inside the Beltway uh, and senior advisor at the Foundation for Defense and Democracy, and then uh, you served on the National Security Council staff from 2019-2020, uh, where you had National Security Advisor John Bolton. You worked on countering Iranian weapons of mass destruction. Uh, was kind of the primary focus, although probably not as exhaustive everything you did uh, at the NSC. And then you and I got to know each other back in the day. We were both uh, kids on Capitol Hill. Uh, you were working for Senator, well, it was at the time, Congressman Mark Kirk, and then yeah. uh, he became a senator uh, from Illinois, and, and and you traveled with him from the— It was actually the kid. You were kind of like the big brother. That's, that's <laughs> that's I can't right. remember. That's the crazy like... uncle. It's not clear, but yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, that's 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 fair. That's, that's, that's yeah. fair. Uh, but then you went on to— uh, the Senate, the upper chamber, got all aristocratic. Right. That's, right. That's uh, right. No longer took anybody's calls from the House. <laughs> Clearly, I remember that, being yeah, frustrated. Yeah. No, no. Um, well, you've had a busy summer um, writing two pieces that are really impactful and important, um, focused broadly on the Middle East. And, and here at Reaganism, as when we focus on foreign policy and national security, it tends to follow the current events, which, of course, takes us to Ukraine, uh, China, Taiwan, and the like. Uh, so we haven't had a conversation on on the Middle East in some time. Uh, I thought you'd be the, the perfect person to bring us up to speed and and really in these, these two issues, two uh, currents. Uh, one is Iran and the Biden administration's approach to Iran, and we'll talk about that uh, in a opinion piece you wrote in the Wall Street Journal on saying that Iran nukes are a thorn for Saudi-Israeli peace. So you looked at it through the lens of how Biden and the administration was engaging Iran and 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 Saudi Arabia and Israel impacted as a result. And then related but some but but separate is the US Israel relationship and uh, what's going on with that relationship in the current Biden administration and particularly uh, security assistance and security support to Israel. And and there's been discussion both in Israel and the United States of whether we have to revisit that. And I remember uh, from your days on Capitol Hill, uh, really a, a key person in advancing the U.S.-Israel security relationship, particularly as it relates to missile defense. So maybe we'll get into all of that. But let, let's start with Iran. Rich, um, tell us the events of the summer. There was uh, the deal to give $6 billion, that's a B for listeners and viewers, to Iran in exchange uh, for freeing uh, Americans that were in Iranian uh, jails uh, and what that meant. And then we'll, we'll go into some of the arguments uh, and how it impacts the region more broadly. But where are we with our relationship with Iran today? Yeah, so really important and completely missed because of the way it's been handled by the administration, uh, uh, fairly impressively in complete secret, outrageously, by the way, but impressively that they could keep this all under wraps like this uh, and control the media flow to the point where we are in a nuclear deal with Iran today. It's already happening. We're in a second nuclear deal. It's in some ways better than the first in that it's completely fragile it's not permanent we're not you know actually waiving sanctions we're, we're not doing all these things that that create a framework where we can't get out of potentially so you've seen you know prime minister netanyahu in israel get asked about this and he says it's bad we oppose this but it's not quite as bad but on the flip side it's actually far worse than the original deal because of what Iran has already achieved in the last two years and what they are allowed to keep doing under the arrangement. So what is the deal yeah. that we are in? 
the deal basically is we have stripped away all the veneer, all the bells and whistles that were used for marketing that original Iran nuclear deal back in 2015, the JCPOA. And we are at the, you know, I'm from Chicago, so this is like a classic extortion racket, you know? <laughs> it's just a clean extortion racket of don't enrich uranium to 90% weapons grade, and we will find spigots of cash to release to you, and we will continue to try to figure this out for the next few months and try to get this crisis to beyond the next presidential election by just paying you not to have a nuclear crisis. There's going to be a crisis where you continue to send arms to Russia. There's crises in the Gulf where we have commercial maritime vessels uh, under attack from the IRGC. Uh, we have U.S. forces in Iraq or Syria potentially under attack. We have assassination plots. We have all these things going on. But just we'll pay you just not to go to 90 percent enrichment. So, so Rich, real quick follow up on that. Great yep. kind of explanation of where we're at right now. Uh, what does that mean? 90 percent. Uh, right. Why is that the threshold? That seems like a lot. Doesn't that mean they're basically there? So why do we right. care? Between, you know, why is 89, 89 percent yeah. OK, but 90 percent is a problem. So 90 percent uh, is this sort of widely accepted technical threshold. Some say 93, 94. But basically, let's say 90 percent, the purity level of enriched uranium. Right. You take you take uranium, you put them into centrifuges, you connect centrifuges, you have cascades of these centrifuges, as they're called. They spin round and round. You you create a new material that, that is highly enriched as you continue to spin it very quickly uh, and continue to do so until you've reached the point where the material is a fissile material, as we say, and it could be the basis for the material put into a nuclear weapon. Right. So you start with low enriched uranium, as the Iranians had done for many years. You then can work your way up into uh, high, high enriched uranium at 20 percent, as the Iranians had done right when Joe Biden was coming into office to test what Biden would do. He didn't do anything except offer to go back to the old nuclear deal. So then they went up to 60 percent enriched uranium, 60 percent enriched uranium from a technical perspective, is like 95, 99% of the way to weapons-grade uranium production. And they continue to perfect that, You know, continue to produce more and more of that 60% stockpile. They're also stockpiling at 20%. You have enough of this material, 20%, 60%, that if you were to feed it into those centrifuges again and you knew how to continue all the way that last 4 or 5%, technically to produce that weapons grade uranium that they could have enough fissile material for at least one bomb in a long weekend more or less and then they can make four five six seven bombs over the weeks ahead if they were to produce actual weapons right so we're talking about the actual material here not the weapon so when when, when we talk about oh are we scared of them going to 90 percent in some ways they're already at the door they're already capable of doing it and the more we allow them to keep their centrifuges, they keep producing enriched uranium, they have the capacity to produce weapons-grade uranium, they're actually constructing a new underground facility right. that's supposed to be so deep underground that they're hoping it's impenetrable to military strike. Right, all of these things mean the threat is still there. It's getting worse every single day. But from a optics perspective, from a media perspective, from a political forcing of the hand to deal with the crisis, if they were to move to 90 percent, there really are no more red lines you can move to. Right. You you have the material for a bomb once you're 90 percent. You could argue that you don't have the material south of 90 percent. Correct. There are crude devices to you could you could make uh, with 60 percent. That, that obviously has been done in history. Um, but. At this point, the kind of weapons that we would expect that they would be trying to field, we would be very fearful. We would have a military red line more more likely than not at 90 percent. Certainly, the Israelis have expressed that they have a military red line at 90 percent. OK, and I want to get to that. So, I mean, you know, it, there's a lot we, we could jump into, which is, you know, you, you started your explanation of saying at the beginning of the Biden administration, they're 20 percent. Right now, they're at 90 percent. That's a, that, that's a. A whole lot of uh, progress they've made against their nuclear weapons program uh, during the Biden administration. Of course, the Trump administration and uh, you were involved in this uh, pulled out of the right. JCPOA. Um, and they sounds to me that 
there was no progress. Iran did not make any progress against their uh, enriching uranium between the time that the United States pulled out of the JCPOA, that, that framework that the Obama administration put in place, until the Biden administration came on board. Uh, but I'm most interested in our ally and partner and friend Israel uh, and their willingness, presumably, to tolerate uh, an Iran that has uh, enriched uranium just shy of 90%. I, I, give me, give us a sense. You speak to Israelis all the time. We we're just yeah. talking about that part of the show. Uh, how does Bibi Netanyahu look at this, and, and does he really even have a red line anymore? Well, we'll remember many years ago, he stood before the UN General Assembly, which is just coming up in a couple of weeks, and he had this cartoonish picture of a bomb like out of you know some kids cartoon yeah. Yeah. and he and he and he drew a line he drew where the red line was and that red line 20 percent enriched uranium is is you know way back in the rear view mirror 60 percent enriched uranium was not a military red line for israel they were caught the, the iranians were caught as they were reconfiguring their cascade in one of their facilities likely to be in a position to go to 90% at any moment that they got directive to do that. They got caught producing, they claimed accidentally, 84% enriched uranium. This is back in January. You have to accidentally produce 84% enriched uranium. Uh, the IAEA was on a snap inspection and, and, and they detected it. And uh, they've said, oh, you know, our mistake, our bad. Uh, oops. Uh, oops, supposed to be 60. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that still is not a military red line as of yet. And so, you know, you have to conclude that either A, Israel may not have the military capability to do so. They claim that they do, and that if there is a moment where they have to go, they will go. Or that whatever their capabilities are, that they would deploy inside of Iran at a level far, far more uh, intense than what we have seen in the clandestine realm, right? So what you're talking about there is that we've heard stories that Israel's able to operate within Iran and kind of hold back their program, take out the scientists, whatever. This would yeah, be- We saw a great. drone attack you know, right. against a facility. We, we've seen uh, people kidnapped, interviewed on, on television, released back, you know, assassinations, cyber attacks, et cetera. If there were to be something that is far greater in this kinetic realm, uh, some sort of convention warfare element added into all of these different gray zone warfare type type um, plays that they make um maybe that's a one-time thing they can do and they're holding back they also by the way know that iran has responses to some kind of escalation and a major area of vulnerability is the northern front and you have hezbollah there you got israel's have, northern israel's northern border israel's lebanon northern and hezbollah border lebanon yeah with tens of thousands, if not more, precision-guided munitions, rockets that are just going to be raining down, missiles going to be raining down. You think that we, you see when, when Hamas in Gaza lights up a rocket attack against Israel is bad? You ain't seen nothing yet, yeah, and the Israelis right. know that. And so all of this is going to happen. The Israeli population needs to be ready for that. The, the, the government needs to be ready for that. IDF needs to be ready for that. The conditions need to be right. And so that if, if the clandestine pieces can still hold off you know that that red line, whatever it is, this the, the terminology you'll hear from some Israelis is a zone of immunity. That's the true red line. Right. It's 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 some point that we don't know, and maybe it's kind of amorphous, where they have an assessment that if they don't go today, they can't go tomorrow. The program could be dispersed. They've reached some technical capacity. There's a facility that's going to be completed underground. Whatever it is, all these pieces come together, and that's. That's their red line. And so 60%, 90%, at this point, it, there's only a political difference in, in the Iranian. Activity. Israel is living with the reality that Iran uh, will be able to go nuclear when TBD. And, Correct. and, and they're, they're, you know, and, and it's just, they're, they actually, from a deterrent standpoint, yes. say that they may have the military capability to take it out, but there's definitely uh, watchers who are skeptical that they could do that. Let's turn to the United States, and this is where I want to bring in your your recent piece in the Wall Street Journal, where you read the tea leaves as the United States has essentially accepted that Iran is going to have a nuclear weapon. Um, they don't want to have uh, to deal with a bad press. They're trying to keep them below 90%. Um, 
And that's introduced a real challenge with the U.S.'s partner, Saudi Arabia, where they're saying, well, if Iran's they're reading the same thing, Iran now has, you know, basically on the threshold of, of, of being a nuclear power, we want to be one too. And the United States response is, Rich? The United States response is, ooh, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. We, we, we can't have you going to China uh, to, to get a nuclear, civil nuclear program that includes enrichment. Um, we obviously, I think Russia is probably not in play at this point just because of the war in Ukraine, but we wouldn't want that either. Uh, the Chinese relationship with the Saudis scares us the most uh, for a range of strategic reasons in the Gulf and the Middle East. Uh, and we've obviously seen reports in the past of ballistic missile cooperation from the Chinese uh, to the Saudis moving now into a civil nuclear program, potentially a military component to that to that nuclear program would be very bad for us. So, you know, rather than reversing our policy on Iran, which we're somehow ideologically wed to, we being the, the Biden administration, uh, we're going to have to come to terms of some kind uh, of uh, a new proliferation policy, a new non-proliferation policy. I'll call it a proliferation policy at this point. Yeah. And, and, and that is, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe this proposal from Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is something that's workable. And by the way, the Israelis are saying at the top level from Netanyahu and his national security advisor and Ron Dermer, the former ambassador to, uh, of Israel to the United States, who now serves in the cabinet. They're all going on TV and saying, yeah, we're open to negotiations over their nuclear program to keep Saudi in the tent, to keep them on side, not let them go to, to a strategic relationship with the Chinese, and ultimately just get them to yes on normalization with Israel. And now yeah, you're- I just want to yeah. slow down there. We're going to break it up. Yeah, so, there's so, a lot going on. Yeah, yeah but, but, but it, I mean, you, you do it well, but just to repeat it. So we have an Iran nuclear problem, and we're solving it by creating a Saudi <laughs> nuclear power. Well, that is MBS's right. solution, right? right that right, is MBS. Right, if, right. I mean, if, if and and I mean, if you're the crown prince and you're focused, well, I get on his perspective. Point, yeah, it, it doesn't. It's not crazy to me. Uh, and we're just in a very fundamentally different position than the United States was back in 2009. And back in 2009, the United States and the UAE entered into what we call technically a one, two, three right. nuclear civil. cooperation, civil nuclear cooperation agreement where, where we're providing uh, licenses, authorization to transfer U.S. based nuclear technology to build a civil nuclear program in the UAE. And as part of that deal, we had established a new nonproliferation, quote unquote, gold standard where any country that is going to enter civil nuclear uh, uh, development needs to forgo enrichment on their own soil so that we don't end up with an Iran type enrichment program that could be some suddenly a, a, a missile a, a weapons program. Right, we right. don't have a North Korea problem. We don't have right. a Pakistan problem. So the UAE agreed to it. They did pre Iran deal. Right. Now we're in this moment, you know, 14 years later, where the policy of the United States is to pay Iran to keep enriching uranium. <laughs> I mean, think about that. So if you're the Saudis, you're like, yeah, heck yeah, I want Me to. Too. I mean, if they got a Tesla, I want a Tesla. And Israel and Israel's perspective on this is they don't really have a choice, right? I mean, they're, they're well, this is difficult for the Israelis. I yeah. think this is this is very, very tense inside the Israeli system, and it should be. Because for the Israelis, and by the way, it should be in the United States as well. Yeah. If the Saudis get enrichment, then the Egyptians say, okay, it's our turn. Right. And then the Turks and Erdogan says, it's my turn. The UAE, by the way, says we're renegotiating the terms of our right. 2009 agreement, of course. You can't. That's 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 gone. Now uh, if you're, you know, part of the U.S., you know, nuclear development community, nuclear infrastructure community, if you're somebody who's been upset for a long time that we don't enrich anymore, by the way, we don't even right. have the capabilities on hand to enrich, like who's actually building this commercially for the Saudis is a great question. Um, but you want to see that uh, industrial base re-expand because it's good for our own nuclear weapons uh, industry and for our civil nuclear infrastructure. Um if you're going to be able to compete with the Chinese, sell you know American products with with strict U.S. oversight, is this some new model that we're just going to sort of uh, assume the risk over? 
where we will have a U.S. sponsored nuclear program in all of these different countries in the most unstable region in the entire world surrounding the state of Israel. Is yeah. Israel going to, yeah. you know, have to have to st start having like contingency plans on the shelf for? Here's how we bomb Saudi Arabia. Here's how we bomb Egypt. Here's how we bomb Turkey. Uh, oh, by the way, within Abraham Accords or Camp David peace treaty countries, you know, this is going to happen. I mean, this, this is the decay of, of the U.S. Uh, extended deterrence, this, the, the umbrella we provide to friends and allies. You do a great job of, of outlining the, the risks involved, both in your written work and, and here. And by the way, of course, you, you can replicate all of this conversation in Asia. As, yeah, as right, people right, right. follow North Korea, South Korea, Japan, all these issues. And, and of yeah. course, we're on the cusp of all of that as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. Good point. Uh, so, so you... You argue, hey, uh, this is all just a little bit crazy, right? We're, we're, I mean, my words, not yours, but this is a region that is unstable. It's, it's consistently unstable, uh, and we're, we're, we're kind of lighting the, the nuclear fuse here, uh, and that's not going to make anything better. So you advocate restoring the international standard of zero enrichment for Iran. So, so I'll give you my, my quick reaction to that, which basically say, hey, let's in, instead of creating other nuclear states, let's just go ahead and prevent Iran from going nuclear, and we solve a lot of problems. Highly compelling, elegant. How, Rich? How do we get yeah. there? Is that is that doable? Because, you know, um, the Trump administration, which which you were a part of for, for some time, did a great job of getting out of JCPOA, but didn't replace it with anything, right? right? And, and perhaps, as you point out, that Iran didn't act uh, during the Trump years, but as soon as Trump left office, you know, as we talked about at the beginning of our conversation, they acted quickly. So how do we do... Uh, how do we get back to restoring the international standard of zero enrichment for Iran, Rich? Yeah, this is like if I was president. Right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. No, of course. We so, just made you, we just yeah, gave you the job. That's great. So to me, this is this is somewhat obvious. But yes, the 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 horse has left the barn uh over over the last or the stable. I guess the cow left the barn. Uh over a lot of ranch metaphors. Yeah, there, yeah. Right? Well it's good. It's very Reagan esque. Yeah. yeah. Uh you know, over the last two years, because of just how far forward they have raced uh, in, in their nuclear program, where they where they are effectively, you can argue over the terminology and what what this really takes, but they're basically a nuclear threshold state at this point. It's it's turnkey in some ways, um, but let's say you could still deter them at this point with a credible military threat from the United States. Uh, really tough sanctions that squeeze their resources, destabilize the regime, force them to have to invest in other places, reallocate resources, uh, combined with the fear of the potential of a military strike by the United States if they take further steps. Um, in that construct where you are keeping Iran in a box, you're keeping the regime in a box, where it knows that if it moves out of the box this way, if it puts an arm up, the arm goes away, uh, then you go to the Security Council and you trigger what is known as the snapback mm. of, of a Security Council resolution that was adopted alongside the JCPOA back in 2015. That was the Iran nuclear deal. And suddenly, just with a letter to the Security Council, with sign-off from our friends in London, Paris, and Berlin, who were all original parties with us uh, in, in the JCPOA, any one of those countries can do it, by the way, under the rules, uh, that's it. Just this the Security Council resolution we have in place today just goes away, and you return to all the prior sanctions resolutions we had put in place from 2000. So back is still alive. We could, if there was agreement amongst allies, that's uh, a heavy if, if I'm sure you'd yeah. agree, um, that we can return uh, to the status quo ante, meaning prior to the uh, JPO yeah. ideal. Um, oh, and by the way, the impetus to do this is more in Europe or should be more in Europe than the United States right now. Well, I'll go ahead on that. Yeah, great point. Because this October, in like seven weeks from now, we are going to see the international missile embargo on Iran go away under the current Security Council resolution because that was part of the deal. That was part of the nuclear deal. We said, not only are we going to put sunset provisions, these, these expiration dates on all your nuclear restrictions under that nuclear deal, which you'll people who were following that debate back in 2015, you'll remember the sunsets, but we'll also give you non-nuclear concessions. The UN conventional arms embargo will expire in 2020. It did. Uh, by the way, 
the armed drones that Iran sends to Russia for use against Ukraine today, they claim fell under the conventional arms embargo. And that's what Russia claims as well. We say no, it's under a missile embargo that's still in place. And every say it's under one. Yeah. Every every press release you see from the E3 and the EU and the United States points to UN Security Council Resolution 2231. And we're gonna crack down on these drone transfers because they violate the missile embargo that's in the resolution. You know what's not in any of those press releases all year? Oh, by the way, this restriction also goes away this October. That's going to have to be removed from every single press release going forward as you see the drones go forward. Oh, and by the way, guess what else starts moving potentially? Short-range ballistic missiles. And I know the Ukrainians, I'll say this to them, and they say, oh, the Russians, evil. They don't care about international law. They're barred. Right, right, right. Look what they do. The Iranians, they don't care. It's like, you know what? It's not actually true throughout history. They do in their propaganda claim legitimacy in their actions. So they they have their reading of international law, and their reading is going to get a lot easier in two months from now because there will no longer be a a restriction on on ballistic missiles. And and notably, this Iran deal I talked about, one of the reported asks we've made is pretty please, you know, let us know how much this will cost, but pretty please, once the embargo... the sunsets in October, don't transfer short-range ballistic missiles. Just don't. Just stick with the armed drones. <laughs> That's right. Don't don't give, don't give don't give the Russians. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me ask you a question. Then I want to move on to this other issue, issue in terms of U.S. Israel secure relationship, Saudi Arabia, and, and U.S. security assistance to Israel. Um, fascinating set of points. Again, we're with Rich Goldberg, senior advisor of the Foundation of Defense and Democracy, former staffer of National Security Council, and uh, Capitol Hill, uh, both in the House and in the Senate. Um, Rich, given where we are right now, and Iranian you know, program is at that threshold, right? So it's a threshold nuclear state, as you've shared. Would we have been better off in the JCPOA. In other words, if 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 in you know President Trump's elected in 2016, you know, 2016 enters office 2017, and you knew that if you pulled out of the deal, Joe Biden would be elected, you know, a few years later, and then you know, basically his last year in office, Iranians would be at 90, you know, just shy of 90 percent. Would you advise then to stay to get out of JCPOA? Yes. Tell me why. Yes. Uh, because I strongly believe that if you just follow the path of JCPOA and you saw the trajectory of international trade that Iran was benefiting from, and you saw where foreign direct investment, particularly from Europe, particularly from Germany, was heading, and you saw where their economy was expanding to, and where all those resources were being put into throughout the Middle East— into their missile program, into their space launch vehicle program, which we know is a cover for an ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile program targeting right. us, not Israel, right. into terrorism, all these other things. Um, and you looked at the sunset provisions alongside that economic expansion and that regional expansion. Uh, these are the, the expiration of all the nuclear requirements of the deal. You get to the point where Iran does everything they're doing today under the full legitimacy of the United Nations Security Council resolution. So they could do everything plus, they're doing today. Plus a trillion dollars. Plus more, all right, some more capital. All right. Why would we ever accept that? We are going to have a crisis with Iran. You either have the crisis when they are weaker or when they are stronger. It is better for our national security, no matter what, for the Islamic Republic of Iran to have less money than more money, and there's a million reasons why. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, to me, the the question is open. Although you make a persuasive argument, is that the Iranians would have been caught violating along the way, and then you, you know, people like you and others, you know, would have been able to hold them accountable and keep them uh, kind of snap and, back. And then we would have snapped back the Security Council resolution, <laughs> just like we could today, because they are there is no more compliance with the nuclear, and yet we still can't snap it right. back because. Because why? I mean, because we they might want to deal, right? Right. They might want to talk. Well, then there in line goes the weakness of the snapback from the outset. It requires, yeah. you know, the, the support of European allies who have just different incentives and and, and viewpoints here. Let, let's let's move on. Uh, although it's all related uh, to 
this discussion that's emerged um, over the past few months, although it's always lingering, as, as you know better than most, uh, in terms of what the security relationship should be and security assistance specifically between the United States and Israel. Uh, and as many of our listeners and viewers know, there is uh, a substantial amount of funds, uh, taxpayer dollars that are spent on mostly U.S. industry uh, to provide um defense platforms and defense support to Israel to some of $3 billion a year. And then on top of that, there's about a half a billion dollars uh, dealing with missile defense, which our, you, Rich, our guest, uh, was was pivotal in, 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 in pushing along and, and becoming part of the security framework. Israelis... Only with the support of the armed services. Oh, we go. Thank and, you. And thank and you. And its leadership. <laughs> I appreciate your nod to jurisdiction. Um but but now with with the, the really uh i would say a strained relationship between president biden and and and, and prime minister netanyahu president biden still is not invited prime minister netanyahu to visit the white house pretty uh, unusual um given in, in the recent certainly in the recent history between the united states and israel um and um the pressure uh that that perceived pressure pressure that the biden administration has placed on Netanyahu's government, as Israel has gone through a really difficult uh, uh, set of challenges domestically between their right and left. Um, and so some people say, we don't want the United States to have leverage over us. And so the way we're going to, uh, way, way we should deal with that, we shouldn't owe the United States anything and and let's not take their money, then the United States would not have leverage. And then there are some voices in the United States uh, from people who are not fans of Israel, are, are, are openly anti-Israel to those who actually are passionate supporters of, of the state of Israel um, would support the United States giving less or reducing or perhaps stopping a security assistance. And then you come out rich and you kind of do a, a really good job explaining, Hey, uh, this is not the way you want to solve the problem. T take us through that for a couple of minutes uh, yeah. of, of, of how you, argue why this secure relationship is good for both Israel and the United States, particularly the security assistance. Yeah. So there's, as you mentioned, there's, there's multiple sides of this coin, right? So you have an Israeli perspective and you have a couple of different perspectives from the Israeli uh, mindset that could be critical, skeptical, opposed to U S foreign assistance. One is from the Israeli defense industry and they're obviously looking for more money out of the Israeli defense budget. Uh, they have their own industrial base. They have their own lobbyists. A lot of former officials uh, who go into think tanks in Israel may or may not be on the rolls of these companies, et cetera, and so they can publish certain things. And so they say, oh, well, you know, every dollar that we take from the United States is a dollar that's not going into our defense company, our our defense industry, our R and D, all these things. You know, so we're we're going to face job losses if if we have to buy American products and you can't use the money to buy Israeli. Okay, that's one thing. That's easily shot down because Israel's defense budget is only so big. Let's call it twenty to twenty three billion dollars. Some people say there's a lot of money hidden there. There's more money. There's less money. Let's just say let's throw out a number of twenty billion dollars in this last budget. Um, you know. If you take away $3 billion, $4 billion from the United States, they're not going to find $4 more billion in a very tight, small, discretionary budget where anybody who's watched the news and sees Israeli politics and sees all these different coalitions in this parliamentary system that wants their piece of the pie for this social program, this education program, there's just not enough money to go around. They're not getting a... a, a 10, let alone 20% budgeting. No. And by the way, they're already spending in Israel way beyond the United States sure. as, as a percentage, percentage of GDP. GDP. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so um, that argument, just it's just hogwash. And because the requirement of the U.S. assistance is for Israel to buy main platforms, more or less, in the United States, to buy platform systems, you know, airplanes, tanks, whatever. You know, you F-35, fifth-generation joint strike fighter, right? Exactly. You get a tanker, you, whatever it is you, you're, you're, you're trying to buy. None of it can be used for R&D. That's a restriction on the aid. And so all of Israel's money gets to be put back into R&D and into Israeli-made systems and Israeli exports, which they have an uh, increasing number of uh, to various countries, including India, South Korea. So 
So all of this is actually very good for the uh, Israeli tech industry, the, the defense industry, the innovation that Israel has, the ability to take their budget and maximize it with what Israel does best, which is innovation, smarts, creativity, outside the box yeah. thinking. Here, here's one takeaway from what you said. I know we're going to go yeah. on to the other yeah, yeah. stakeholder, but just uh, kind of crystallizing in the following way, as I understand your argument, if the United States or Israel stopped to, you know, decide not to take the U.S. money, it would almost have to buy that you know, hundred million dollar per copy uh, fighter aircraft out of its own budget and pay the United States for it. Right. If they didn't go to the United States, as I think you point out, they'll have to go to China or Russia, and those aren't really good options either. With They're not going to China. They're not going so to China. It's, it's a double loss, right? You don't have the money yeah. for tech investment and R and D. Because they're going to be taking their own dollars now Correct. to buy those things. You're not going to have an Israeli Air Force Correct. without Israeli aircraft. Uh, sorry, they're, without, they're, aircraft. They're, they're still buying the, the additional F-15 squadron. They're not exactly. saying, oh, I, we don't need F-15s anymore. Right, right. Right, exactly. Correct. Uh, the second part of an Israeli argument is one you mentioned, which is, you know, why why do we have to be at the beck and call of the United States government when they do things like meddle in our judicial reform and treat our prime minister like this and go into a nuclear deal and try to buy us off with aid or threaten the aid or leverage the, you know, and meanwhile, there's these crazy people, leftists, the squad, et cetera, barking at us. And this is not worth it. We should have freedom of action in the Middle East. We should be able to do what we want free of political pressure from any White House. And cutting the cord here will allow us to stand our own feet and make our own decisions. Oh, it sounds very compelling. And it just continues to come up anytime there's a hostile Democratic president. This came up during Obama. This sure. now comes up during Biden. And the truth is, is, is twofold. Number one, Israel still has freedom of action today. It doesn't check with the White House every time you read that there is some strike that just happened in Damascus, which is almost nightly. Right. They, and you make they, a great point. And they do that with which platforms? <laughs> right. They do it with our platform. They do right. it with the, the, the F-35 that they bought from us or with an F-16 or an F-15. They don't they don't check with us when they have daring raids. Uh, sometimes they kind of check. And there's different reports on that. We think about um, the 2007 al Kabar reactor Syria. strike in Syria, which denied Assad uh, his own nuclear weapon. Um, my God, if that had not happened and the United States had not taken action. Uh, and so, by the way, a strike carried out with U.S. purchased aircraft. And back in 1981, right, when the Israelis took out the Iraqi reactor at Osirak, again, with U.S. Uh, platforms, uh, something that took the Americans by surprise. Uh, you know, yes, there's there's hand wringing. Maybe there's you know, uh, demarches from the State Department, the White House. There was, there was a president who was kind of unhappy it, it, that day. It, in the Reagan administration, they 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 did a little bit more than that. Right. Uh, but uh, we can talk about that. But in the end, the Congress controls the purse string. The Congress appropriates money. The Congress is strongly supportive of Israel, even with the Squad and some of these other loud barkers, uh, like Senator Van Hollen and others in the Senate. And and so. You know, Israel is going to do what Israel is going to do. The flip side of it is also true, by the way. Cut off the $4 billion. There's no more foreign assistance from the United States to Israel. Does anybody believe that the same political calculation that the Israeli government would use of whether or not to carry out an action, whether or not to execute a decision based on the, what the United States thinks will change? It won't. It won't because ultimately the United States is the superpower. The United States is the big protectorate. No matter what, yes, the Israelis can stand on their own. They can do a lot of things. They do do a lot. Of, they don't ask us to protect them. They don't ask us to fight their wars. But they depend on the projection of United States power, confidence, and alliance. And so if they're going to go tick off a White House, you know, have a political war distance with the United States, that is very much to their security disservice in the right. region they don't want daylight between well, I, and, I, and i think that's what's uh that's what seems to be missing in the discussion now, that last point and, and, and there's both in israel and the united states people's assumption about the state of israel which is remarkable and what it's done economically militarily um you know and, and and now diplomatic with the abraham accords uh but the notion that it is so strong and capable that it could stand on its own I mean, the United States needs allies. We look at that as our competitive advantage. You know, you work the National Security Council, the National Security Strategy. 
that is even more true for a small power, right? A, a regional power, which is what Israel is. They need friends and allies. So this notion that they, they could stand on their own um, and don't need this, uh, and even get some people go so far as say the United States needs Israel more than Israel needs the United States. I mean, those, those arguments, um, I, I, I think, are really um, have fail to have even a basic understanding of the relationship between great powers and even a regional power, let alone small, vulnerable countries. 100% agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rich, so take oh, me oh, through. Oh, other side of the coin. Other side, is yeah. The, is the U.S. side, because you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. You got the far left folks who just want to conditionate to Israel, tie it to the Palestinian issue and the occupation. That You can't help those people. Those people are, you know, that uh, they made I mean, the decision. Time. They made their decision. They they yeah. just don't like the state of Israel. They're against state of Israel. They they this is just their political uh, way of, of trying to advance BDS uh, through the Appropriations Committee. Right, right. Uh, the other side is the far right, and some of them may be anti-Semitic. Some of them are. Um, some of them may actually think that they support Israel. But they have this worldview of saying we should not be in the business of foreign aid. That includes Israel. Ultimately, I don't want to hurt Israel, but we got to get Israel off of our foreign aid. You may have heard this from a presidential candidate recently. Yes, they did take us through Vivek Ramaswamy. <laughs> I mean, that just happened. You know, it happened in, in in the Midwest. You know, we could go. It could happen again at the Reagan Library in a few weeks. Right, so, right. I mean, this is you know, and Nikki Haley had her moment. Frankly, right. uh, I mean, I don't know if you view it this way, but from where I stand, it was that was really what got her going. It was Ukraine and Vivek's stance that we want to somehow let Israel stand on its own. And this is, to me, a fundamental misunderstanding of what our aid is, and that it's not just welfare. It's yes. not some gift. The immense return on investment that we get for what is essentially a rounding error on $3.3 billion in foreign military financing for Israel every year, and the $500 million we do for co-production, co-development, co-R&D on missile defense. So what we get out of that is unbelievable in the relationship. First of all, you could have a parochial argument on the defense industrial base, yeah, right? It, it, it helps. It, it, it helps all those guys. And not just about jobs. You know, yeah. people who are in, of this perspective will say, like, "Well, I'm not into defense welfare." Correct. All this stuff. Industrial. I, I, I'm not. I'm not doing that here. I'm actually going to tell you that if you still want them to be able to sell great weapon systems in the world, then guess where is actually an active conflict 24 seven where us made technology is on display for all of our allies to see it working and defending an ally it's in israel and every time the israelis use a us platform and show the rest of the world wow look what they can do i'm telling you a whole bunch of other democracies pick up the phone and call the united states defense industry and, and it deters adversaries. And, it deter and it deters adversaries there as well that's number one number two because it's an active war environment, it is a laboratory for our defense yep. industrial base. We are learning how the enemy reacts. We're learning new tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures. We're learning how the Israelis use these things in very creative ways. And we then actually take their tactics and put them in the field for our war fighters. Or we adapt how we are going to produce the next generation of, of a certain platform. And so there is a feedback loop that is always going on where we are just connected so incredibly tightly in a national security defense policy space with the Israelis in this technology development space as well. And that's critical when we think about tr threats from China, when we threat about North Korea, Russia, et cetera. Let me, let me go to one more, uh, and maybe this is a good way to pivot to Saudi and bring bring our, our Saudi, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia back into this conversation. Okay, okay. Which is, it's back. and then and then we'll, we'll go to our lightning round. Great conversation with Rich Goldberg, senior advisor of the Foundation of Defense and Democracies. Um, here, here it is. It's, it's part of the security assistance, the benefit, as you were just outlining some arguments, the benefit of the United States is it stabilizes the region, right? So in the absence of U.S. technology, U.S. defense platforms, Israel maybe could develop on their own, but they're not an industrial power, so it'd be hard. Um, they may get it from elsewhere, which would be good for us, China and Russia would discuss, or they just may have to ratchet it up and we could find Israel in an armed conflict with an Arab country or Iran in the form of another Islamic country that lives, that's nearby. That's not great for the United States either. 
right? To have Israel and Iran going at it or Israel and Saudi Arabia going at it. We've seen that, right? We saw that in, in you know, but the second half of the, the 20th century, a number of occasions, just not a great place to be. So if you're looking to stabilize a region, you give Israel the qualitative military edge, and that ultimately costs us less than some huge conflagration in the Middle East, where the United States, one way or another, is going to find itself involved. So I, I think that it, there's a stabilizing component, not unlike what we're seeing, you know, in a different way, um, in other regions of the world, right? Um, right. And, and so that's, that's a clear benefit to the United States keeping us out. Well, so it's really interesting, because I think that we're now getting to the crux of Reaganism, we're getting to the crux of what our foreign policy should be. And this is a Middle East conversation, but it should be focused in, in each region. In this construct, there is somebody who's running for president who published a, a, pr a pretty big essay. And the the term Nixonian equilibrium pops up over and over again. <laughs> and and this, this idea that we should have a Nixonian equilibrium in the Middle East, which can only be achieved by the status quo we're in today, where Iran has some power. Iran must be balanced in their power with the Sunni Arabs, with Israel, because then there's a stasis. Now we have this uncomfortable, uneasy equilibrium, as this author puts it. Uh, I would I would beg to differ. We have seen that when Iran is empowered, when they're emboldened, this is the, the fundamental misunderstanding of Obama's foreign policy. And by the way, that was Obama's foreign policy, especially for the Middle East, uh, is that Iran feels empowered, emboldened to expand. It is a revolutionary power. It is an expansionist dictatorship. Therefore, it's not going to be happy with equilibrium. It can only be stalled or stopped or contained or moved backward or rolled back, whatever word you want to use, if they do not have equilibrium, if they are not in a dominant position, if they are not on the cusp or believing that they could achieve a dominant position. And that means, to your point, ensuring that Israel has the qualitative military edge in the region, and that as you bring Abraham Accords countries online and integrate the security architecture, it's not balanced with the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's in a position to be able to contain the Islamic Republic of Iran and potentially roll it back to within its borders and eventually see it crumble uh, into the dustpan of history. Well, well, well said. Um Last one, we'll go to lightning round. So Saudi Arabia and Israel have been flirting with each other. The United States has certainly tried to facilitate. This is an area of continuity between the Trump administration and the Biden administration in the sense that Abraham Accords is a positive diplomatic, economic, and political framework for the Middle East. They did it with the UAE. Can we do it with Saudi Arabia? What's unique about the Saudi-Israel possibility of, 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 of entering, you know, being the Uber partner in the Abraham Accords is the security component. And it kind of goes back to what we are talking before Saudi in part wants to be a nuclear, you know, kind of have the nuclear agreement to deal with Iran. Uh, but even with the price of them entering an agreement with Israel, they want some security assurances as well, independent of, or in addition to uh, the Iran equation. How do you look at that Rich Goldberg? Uh, I look at what is in the American interest, and the American interest is absolutely a Saudi Arabia that liberalizes uh, and moderates Islam in the Middle East. Uh, if women are being empowered, uh, if slowly but surely entertainment, a uh, moderate type of Islam is coming online and has pushed forward economic uh, realization of these Vision 2030 goals, uh, really trying to revolutionize what the Arab Middle East looks like. Uh, how it thinks, how it operates. Um, these are all positive things that we couldn't achieve on our own through 20 years of a global war on terrorism, but that potentially the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is able to achieve if he keeps pushing forward on those indicators. So that's positive for us. The counter Islamic radicalism piece is just so, I, I can't get off how important that piece is. We forget about it all the time. Mm -hmm. And the security architecture, the economic integration between Arabs uh, and Israel and the dominoes that may or may not fall, we hope they would fall after Saudi Arabia would normalize, is all in the U.S. interest, which means that we absolutely can get a normalization agreement done because these are all things that are in uh, Saudi Arabia's interest and MBS's interest right. and in Israel's interest. Uh, we probably will need to deliver some major defense commitment to Saudi Arabia to get it done, potentially even a treaty commitment, a mutual defense uh, treaty, which is what they're asking for. Uh, and there will be some civil nuclear program 
And the question is, will it include enrichment? And if it does, what does that look like? Great outline. Do uh, you think it's going to happen before uh, we have the next election here in the United States? I would say 60-40 it'll happen. 60-40 will happen. Fascinating. And, you know, you, it's funny. You have a lot of detractors of Bibi Netanyahu, both in Israel and the United States, who desperately don't want the Biden administration to help make this happen because they don't want to give Bibi that win. Uh, interesting, at least my read of it, is that the Biden administration says whatever issues they have at Bibi Netanyahu and the current Israeli government, they realize that from U.S. national interests, as you've just articulated, this is far more important. And I think actually, oh, and for Saudi's interest, think about this from MBS perspective. He's got, he might turn Biden from from the man who wanted to make him a pariah to strong defense partner. Yeah, right? so great, great so point as well, right? The point where the Democratic Party is the one that's really sort of in this JCPOA lens, been very anti-Saudi. If he gets a Democratic president to bless this, that changes the politics of of Saudi Arabia, and I think yeah. they understand. That. Although I I do see Iran as a spoiler in all of this, one way or another, uh, they're not going to want this to happen. Uh, but that perhaps is for another conversation. Let's go to lightning round. Uh, Rich, give us your favorite Reagan quote, speech, and possibly book mm -hmm. on Reagan. I noticed one behind you. Yes. On this very nice oh, book. Yes. House. From our very good friend, uh, Will Inboden, uh, who we wish good luck to at the University of Florida. Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, I am actually halfway through it, so it's already my favorite book, and I encourage everybody to get it, The Feast Maker. Um, <laughs> I'm you. also a big fan of what potentially may or may not be real, but I think it's real, so I like it. Uh, Victory by Peter Schweitzer, uh, the, the story of, of winning the Cold War. Yeah. It, it's a thriller, so whether or not there's liberties taken, I know there's critics out there. Um, I like it. Uh, I encourage everybody to read it. Uh, my favorite quote um, is actually one I was raised on, um, it was, uh, boys will be boys. Hmm. Uh, this is, uh, I think that's it's the first here for, uh, Reaganism. So go ahead, share more. Oh, really? You know, oh. no one's offered it to any of our guests. Oh, it's my favorite. Uh, it's what always comes to mind. Cause I was, I was raised on this idea of Reagan and, you know, the consternation over AWAC sales to Saudi Arabia, the response to the 81 OCRX wreck, all these things that happened. There's a lot of controversy over like, what was Reagan's view of Israel? How did he, how did he, you know, he's actually a strong supporter of Israel, strong Zionist, um, strong attachment to the Jewish community. Uh, and Richard Allen tells a story that when Reagan was notified of the OCRAC strike, his reaction was, very just matter of factly, boys will be boys. <laughs> I think I pissed. I'm pretty sure of that too. But yes, that's a good yes, one. Yes. All right. We got the book. We got the quote. You got a speech also? Ah, speech. So I'm very much in my mind where everyone else is, which is in this uh, presidential primary uh, moment uh, of time. And so that's been on my mind a lot as I look at the candidates and I, and I look at the primary field. Uh, and I was recently with uh, Will Inboden uh, at a conference that he was speaking at, and I, he was talking about his book, and he was reflecting on Reagan, and he, he mentioned something that I think we all sort of understand, but it was not really just captured for me in this way until he said it, that if you look at the late 1970s and you look at today, the similarities are unbelievable when you see talk about the economy, inflation crisis, and energy crisis, uh, a Cold War emerging that people are saying we might not be able to win, uh, a real sort of self-defeatist attitude of the United States military in our defense posture, uh, not spending what we need to be spending on, on our defense industrial base and on our military to win any, any conflict in the future, uh, all these things. And you could really just get sad about it and, and really just talk in the language of, of American decline and just internalize American decline and make that the, the, the posture of your policies, which I think I see a lot in the field right now. And I went back and I read the 1980 speech to the convention when mm. he accepts his nomination. And I've read so many of them and you read them over and over again. And there's so many that are inspiring. You can, you can pick this one or that one. And certainly, you know, standing in front of Soviet dissidents in the Soviet Union and talking to them and what he says there and off the cuff pieces of his remarks are amazing. But I encourage everybody to pull up the RNC convention speech, accepting the nomination in 1980. And don't tell me you don't feel like it's 2023. Oh, yeah. That's a great point. Completely. And by the way, it was a very different version of Make America Great Again. Yes. Yes. Which is in that speech. Rich Goldberg, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. 
If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.